Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Dave Emmons Show. And uh, today, of course, we got some bad storms out there, a winter storm that's coming through. So if we have more glitches today than we normally do on Zoom, that's probably part of the reason. We're, we're speaking from Indiana and Illinois, and we're right in the track of that storm. So just wanted to tell you that. Uh, but we'll have uh, David will be back, even though he has a lot of material to cover today. He'll probably be back soon. And uh, I'm glad that you guys are taking interest in this in the first show that he's done. And that's still going on. So and with this cold weather, stay inside, watch our, watch our programs, watch our shows. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to do a little selling. I, t I told my guests, I'm going to take up a, a minute or so. Uh, this is my first book released in March and that's they, what do they want? That's about my ET and UFO experiences lifelong. And then my second book released in August was this book. It's uh, senseless wars and conflicts. And it's about my combat memoirs and also senseless wars uh, that we have fought ever since then so those are my two books buy them and help me out okay and now our guest today is david white he was just on and uh, matter of fact his first uh, segment is running right now he's award-winning writer 20 years experience in creating content for chicago and he has done multiple and completed screenplays and novels uh, many not many of them but i guess some a lot I, what word I use a year, I don't really know, David, but you are a great writer. I know that he's an experiencer with UFOs and ETs. He's moderately psychic. He has uh, abilities in psycho, uh, psycho, so psychometry, and he he's, he does readings and uh, touching objects. He's also got into remote viewing a little bit. Hey, he's uh, knows a little bit about Knights Templar and the history and the ancient history, and that's what we're going to talk about today. And uh, David White, of course, you, if you've seen him before, we I don't have to go through the whole thing again, but he's got a lot of subjects and he does a lot of investigations. He's an investigator. He studies a lot and, and he just he does it because that's what he loves to do. And I love hearing a lot of his, his investigation, uh, uh, you know, determinations. Uh, David White, welcome back to the show again. Thanks, Dave. So in all the times I've been here before, we, we continually touch on, but never get a chance to explore the Knights Templar and their search for the Holy Grail. So I figured maybe today, if we can get it in in 55 minutes or less, we're going to talk about what the Holy Grail was, where it went, and the connections with the Knights Templar. And everybody's interested in that Oak Island. Oak Island show program is number, one of the number one documentary, not documentary, but uh, reality shows, they call it. They're, yep. they're number yep. one, I believe. So everybody's interested uh, in it. I, I will say this about the Oak Island show. It's it's now in their, what, ninth, tenth season, tenth mm -hmm. season. Yeah. Um, they found a lot of evidence that somebody was doing a lot of work there. They're still trying to figure out what was buried in the money pit. Um, part of the problem they've had is there have been so many uh, shafts sunk in the uh, money pit area, it's really hard to tell where the original money pit was. And it may have collapsed down to a lower level. I think the bedrock is around 108 feet. So trying to get to that area has been very problematic. I will say that in my first book, Eternal Horizons on the Trail of the Temple of Treasure, which is not published yet, but I'm going to be talking to some agents in January, I end with Oak Island. And I submit that Oak Island may have been used long before modern times, say the 15 or 1600s. Uh, if we know that the water level of the oceans rose three or 400 feet at the end of the Lesser Dryas event, which is around 10,500 BC or so, then it's possible that at 10,500 BC, when the ocean levels were lower, there were sea caves along that area. We know that there are sea caves now in Newfoundland and Nova Scotia, where the, the softer stone is eroded by the action of the waves. And it's possible that somebody secreted something there at the time right before this uh, event was going to happen. And it happens to be the same location where Oak Island is. Um, I know that they've done some searching offshore. It's possible that they may not have found everything that they're going to find. And maybe only from going in through the ocean areas will they be able to locate that. Regardless, let's get into the Ark of the Covenant. Yes. Um, I guarantee you there, there's a there's a great Dire Straits song. One of the lyrics says, two men say they're Jesus, one of them must be wrong. And that's just kind of the hypocrisy of people who claim to have knowledge. Um, nobody knows 
this day and age where the Ark of the Covenant is. There are a lot of people who have theories. There are a lot of people who have claimed to see the Ark of the Covenant or have touched it. They're all wrong. I, I might Sorry. be whacked. I might be whacked out, David, but uh, that's not a signal. But I'm, I might be whacked out. But it's a. Uh, I I think ET's come back and got it. You might be whacked out. Yes, I don't think the <laughs> ETs have. I don't think they have any need or desire or use for or interest in the Ark of the Covenant. Well, they they're get, having a hard enough time they, trying to figure out how we can call deep dish pizza pizza and thin crust pizza pizza and california style pizza pizza it's like they're not all pizza it's like well yes they are they're just different regional varieties yeah, right they're they're having a hard, hard enough time trying to keep track of us using nuclear weapons i don't think they're interested in the ark of the covenant at all well they're the one I who created the ark of the covenant and and gave it to uh uh, uh you know to uh moses, to moses yeah yeah that's an interesting okay so let's get into that so um the there is no discussion of the Ark of the Covenant outside of biblical texts. There's nothing in the Quran. There's nothing in Buddhism. There's nothing in any other literature. It only exists as far as Buddhist, uh, sorry, uh, Old Testament uh, writings are concerned, primarily in Exodus and Deuteronomy. Those are the only ones that actually describe the Ark of the Covenant. Exodus describes how it was made, it was made of acacia wood. It's approximately uh, one and a half cubits wide, one and a half cubits tall, two and a half cubits long. It had gold rings so that you could carry it with poles. It specifically talked about making it out of acacia wood. The problem is we don't really know what acacia wood was. There's really no acacia wood growing in that area. Some people think that that was cedar. Some people think it was some other kind of wood. But even from the very first mention of it in Exodus, there's questions, there's doubts about what it really was. Um, it supposedly had two cherubim sitting on the top with their wings outstretched towards each other. We don't know what the cherubim were. The seraphim and the cherubim are these descriptors that are used in the Bible but are never explained. So we already have a problem there. Um, there are There's a description in Deuteronomy where it doesn't even mention that it was gold covered at all. It was just a wooden box in Deuteronomy. Yeah. Um, I just finished reading a long, and I'll, I'll give the link to Dave Emmons to put in the description for this video, um, a long discussion um, on the Torah.com website where they discuss the possibility that every single community of Israelites had their own ark. And to them, it was a portable structure that was hollow that allowed them to keep either the Torah, uh, their copy of it, or other uh, religious artifacts. Um, there are, there is a discussion that's that is covered in this great book that I want to make sure everybody gets a copy of. Lost someday. Secrets of the One Sacred Ark. Yeah. Lost Secrets of the Sacred Ark by Lawrence Gardner, G-A-R-D-N-E-R. -E fellow has passed away. He's written a number of great books, um, but this one is fascinating in the way that he describes not just what the Ark of the was, but what the Ark of the Covenant was, but why it's significant, why it's important. So um, he, he comes close to what you think uh, it, an explanation is about the Ark? Well, he goes into much more detail than most people. Um, he points out that there were two, ta two sets of tablets that were given to Moses, that Moses went up to the mountaintop right. in Sinai twice. The first time when he goes up, he comes down with something called the Tablets of Testimony which supposedly are these two sheets of material called sapphire, S-A-P-P-I-R, which is where we get the term sapphire. Depending on how you define that, it's either green or blue plates. These descriptions suggest that these plates were translucent. These are not the stone tablets of the tablets of law, which Moses got the second time. So Moses supposedly goes up the first time. He spends 40 days and 40 nights up there. The reason the number 40 is used so often in the Bible is because the cycle of Venus going around the sun in our night sky appears to carve out a five-pointed star, an upside-down five-pointed star, which has been used in symbology for as long as we've been watching stars. And the people in the that wrote the Bible wanted us to remember that 40-year progression, so they used the number 40 repeatedly. Uh, the, it rained 40 days and 40 nights, supposedly for the flood. 
That's just another memnotic to remember the 40 year cycle of Venus. That's like the age of Mephistopheles was supposedly 365 years. Well, he wasn't really 365 years. It was just that was a good way to remember how many days there were in a year. Although they should have said he was 365 and a quarter years old. That would have been a little better. So um, uh, as, as Lawrence Gardner lays it out, Moses goes up to the mountaintop first, stays up there for 40 days and 40 nights, comes down with the tablets of testimony. These appear to be synonymous with the tablets that Thoth created. Thoth, also known as uh, Hermes Trismegistus, according to the Greeks, the thrice blessed, that supposedly contained all the knowledge of the world. The interesting thing is, if you ever open up a computer and look at the motherboard, the motherboard are, is a thin, translucent piece of green material right. that if you didn't know any better, you'd say that that was some kind of sapphire or sapphire uh, material. Um, these plates then break, and Moses has to go up a second time. While he's gone the second time, he instructs the Israelites to gather up all the gold in the camp, melt it down, and make the ark per the instructions that Yahweh gave him. By the way, we'll take a moment to talk about Yahweh. Yahweh is has many names. He's known as the jealous God. He's known as the God of the of the mountains. Uh, the, he was basically a storm God that sort of kind of followed the Israelites around. Um, there are theories that he may have been one of the leftovers from the three hierarchies of the Egyptian pantheon. The first group was basically the bird-headed gods who existed once the first flood left the land, and they ruled for some thousands of years. When they left, they left a group called the crew behind. There's actually an Egyptian term that means the guys that rode the boat. Those are the second pantheon of gods, and they ruled for thousands of years. When they left, they left their children behind, and those are the gods that we know of from dynastic Egypt, which is, you know, Osiris and Isis and Thoth and all those other ones, um, Seth. Um, so Yahweh appears to have been a physical entity. When he meets Moses, he lands on Mount Sinai with smoke and fire and shakes the ground and scares the Israelites. So he doesn't just appear in the clouds. He physically lands like a rocket ship. But only Moses is allowed to go up and talk to him. And this is a uh, tradition that dates back to Sumerian times where only the high priests were allowed to go on top of the ziggurats mm -hmm. to meet with the gods. And before they could go up there, they were ritually bathed and purified and given baths of incense smoke, which sounds to me and to other people like they're trying to clean them so that they don't carry diseases or pests like, you know, lice or something like that up to these fragile, um, non-godlike uh, physical beings. So Moses goes up there a second time. When he comes down the second time, there's something that's taken over Moses's presence. He now glows. I was going to ask you about that. Yeah. We're, yeah, we're getting some interference, I guess, maybe the weather. Oh, Dave, I'm sorry. I, I, uh, but my audience is calling me and I have to. Okay, yeah, yeah, we lost you a little bit there. He has to wear a, a veil over his face for the rest of his life because just looking at his face is kind of shocking to the Israelites. Um, when he comes back the second time, he has the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments at that point are basically a truncated version of what's known as the, I want to say they're called the Pyramid Text, but I'm not sure that's correct. There was a group of 15 vows that the Pharaoh had to make in order to get into heaven. Right. <clears throat> and these 10 commandments are 10 of those 15 vows that include things like the Pharaoh saying, I have not stolen, I have not taken my neighbor's wife, I have not you know, used the, my Lord's name in vain. All of those things basically originated with a fifth dynasty set of instructions that the Pharaoh had to follow. I was going, I was going to ask you uh, that, about uh, the Egyptian culture, and I just I just finished my manuscript for my third book, uh, and I studied that. You said the fifteen things, and mm -hmm. that 
that, that, that has something to do with passing that down to Christianity. It seemed like they picked up a lot of the rules from the, the Egyptians. Right. Right. And, and one of the things is that these 10 commandments were just laws that the Israelites had to follow when dealing with other members of their people, of their tribes. It did not, unlike when it says thou shalt not kill, it basically means thou shalt not kill other Israelites. Mm -hmm. um, when they take over the Holy Land, they basically depopulate the land. They kill every man, woman, and child in city after city after city. They also kill all the livestock, all the pigs, all the chickens, all the cows, in order so that if they missed anybody, when they came back, there wouldn't be anything for them to subsist on. That's not a very godlike thing, and it's very difficult to accept as modern people to read this, but that's that's what happened. That's what they did. They they killed lots and lots of people. They fought basically to take over the Genocide. land of yeah. Israel. Genocide. So anyway, yeah. So so they're given this box, which it's interesting that only one tribe, the Levites, were allowed to carry this box. Only the Levites. And when they carried it, they had to carry it barefoot. Now, there are theories that what this golden box made of a special kind of wood was, was a capacitor, that it stored static electricity. It has wings at the top, which can act like, uh, like, uh, I mean, antenna almost. Yeah, transmitter. Since you got them facing towards each other. Mm -hmm. um, it had, according to Exodus, it had three objects inside. It had Aaron's broken staff that he used um, uh, when Moses and Aaron were meeting with Pharaoh, um, which later budded and had leaves on it. Except the Ark of the Covenant is not long enough to keep the staff in there in one piece, so it had to be broken in half to be put in there. It had a pot of manna, and Lawrence Gardner in Lost Secrets of the Sacred Ark goes into great detail about what manna is. And it supposedly had the tablets, except depending on how you interpret the reading of the Old Testament, especially Exodus, <coughs> it's either the tablets of the law, the Ten Commandments, or it's the tablets of testimony, the two sheets of gray sapphire, uh, sorry, green sapphire. It's possible, if you think of it in modern terms, if the green, and this is a stretch, I admit, but other people have suggested these theories as well. If you had a technological device that you were making, you would need a motherboard, a power source, and maybe something to give it unusual powers. Um, Lawrence Gardner talks about manna being something that the Egyptians knew about, where if you took gold and applied a high enough electrical content to it, say the level of a lightning bolt, then you can turn gold into something called monatomic gold, which is a powder. When it turns into a powder, it gives off a flash of light. And that powder then becomes superconductive, which is a nice trick to have, especially if you want a box that uses electricity to attack its enemies that can levitate and fly on its own. Um, this, this monatomic gold apparently also is edible, whereas regular gold is toxic, as most heavy metals are. Um, the, uh, the ability for monatomic gold to work in the human body apparently gives ex uh, extra length or life to anybody who consumes it. And in ancient Egypt, they used to bring this manna substance to the pharaohs, which not only gave them longer life, but somehow allowed them to, to make the journey into heaven. So the, the pot of manna being in the Ark of the Covenant is a very unusual and very interesting facet. Um, if you had, uh, say, for example, the tablets of testimony, which were possibly computer plates that were somehow, excuse me, my cat wants to get in the video. Hold okay. on a yeah. That's a, yeah. I was just going to say that manna, uh, they say fed uh, Moses' people. It uh, dropped down from heaven and got on the ground yes. and they picked it up and ate it. So this manna in, in a gold dust form is can actually sustain a person? Uh, um, not like normal food, no. Yeah. But it can uh, apparently, so like the, the cells in a human body will uh, duplicate a certain number of times. 
there are little um, basically bookends on your cells, uh, on your cell's DNA that clip off one of these each time it duplicates. And when it gets to the end, it stops duplicating. And that basically kind of sets up a limited amount of time that your cells can duplicate. Um, I can't remember the name of these things. I think they're teller, tellurides or tellurides. Or yeah, tellurides. tellurides, yeah, something like that. Whatever they are. Um, apparently, if you consume monatomic gold, according to some research, it increases the length of these things so that it can maybe extend your life. Yeah. According to some theories. Okay, so the Ark of the Covenant has um, Aaron's broken staff, which might not have been broken, broken, but maybe disassembled. There may have been a power source inside there if this was a technological device. And that power source was then used inside the Ark of the Covenant to connect to maybe, and I, again, this is a wild theory, but other people have made this theory before me, that the tablets of testimony, the green sheets, the sappy, which were broken, supposedly, maybe just needed a new power source. And this power source connects to them and then somehow works with the pot of manna, which is a superconductive substance, all placed inside a gold-covered um, capacitor filled with static electricity that then allowed this whole thing to operate like a powerful device. The problem we have is that none of this was written down until 600 years minimum after it all occurred. So if you go back from today and look at something from the 1400s, like the cathedrals, you know, we now have great um, research showing us what, um, uh, you know, what they did to build the cathedrals, even though they had nothing written down, it was all in the master masons heads, we can tell now what they did. But if we didn't have that technology, how would we, or, or sorry, that, uh, that backup, that background writing, we would have no idea how they built such magnificent structures. And when they finally wrote down in, around 800 AD, some of the things that had happened in the Old Testament, sorry, 800 BC, uh, they didn't actually have any of this written down for 600 years. So a lot of this, excuse me again. <laughs> the kitty cat. Yeah, I was just going to ask you the question. They haven't really been able to decide when Moses, uh, you know, left Egypt and took his people. Was that about 800 BC or what? No, it was... Um, Depending on the best results we have now, it was about 1300 BC, 1340, 1330 BC. Okay. There, I'm going to have to sell my cat, I believe. <laughs> well, she wants in, she wants out, she wants in, she wants out. Yeah. Um, there have been e efforts to try to tie the plagues in Exodus to the explosion of Mount Thera, also known as Santorini, um, in the... Uh, Greek islands in the Aegean, which we're pretty sure based on things like uh, carbon-14 dating and dating of uh, smoke and debris and ash that has fallen in as far away as Greenland, which means it went around the world and landed in Greenland. We're pretty sure that happened in the mid-1600s BC. So it's really hard to tie those two together. It's possible that they did happen at the same time but they weren't written down until two or 300 years later. Yeah, that's, that's one, that staff, David, that you're talking about. That's how Moses found water with that staff. And he's able to open up an underground water source. And then also supposedly. he parted the yes. seas with that staff. Right, right. I think it so, could have been that magical? Um, could, or that technological? Yeah, yeah. sure. Where did sure. it, um, it come from? Well, we're we're dealing with... Yahweh, who is a physical being who can land with smoke and fire on top of a mountain with such force that it vibrates the ground. It sounds like a rocket ship to me. Yes. Okay. If, if he had a rocket ship and then had plans to build a portable capacitor for the Israelites to be able to communicate to him, then we're, we have to be talking about technological devices. The problem with that is then it removes the magic and mystery from religion, but maybe this religion is based on a misunderstanding of what was actually going on. Yahweh, the name, comes from when the Israelites were asking Moses, 
who are you talking to? Because they didn't know who this guy was that Moses was talking to. And Moses's reply was basically, don't worry about it. He is who he is. And that's actually what Yahweh means. He is or I am who I am, which is not an answer. It's an evasion. It's basically saying, I'm not going to tell you what my name is. You don't need to know. Mm. Okay. So we have, we have the Ark of the Covenant we think is a gold-covered box with these wings on the top through which God or Yahweh can speak to the Israelites. But only a certain group of, of, of Israelites are allowed to carry it. They have to be barefoot when they carry it. And sometimes this thing can levitate and go on ahead on its own. And in one description, when they're coming uh, close to the, the uh, area of Jerusalem, they send scouts on ahead to the area of the Bekaa Valley in Lebanon, where giants supposedly live. And the scouts came back to Moses and said, hey, there's some really big dudes up there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the description in the Old Testament is we are as crickets or grasshoppers in their vision, in their right. view. So we're tiny compared to them. So Moses sends the Ark of the Covenant, and the Ark of the Covenant supposedly destroys them in a whirlwind of fire. Yeah, these are supposed to be the Nephilim, right? Uh, in the in the land of milk and honey, it's supposed to be the Nephilim, the um, humans, maybe. Yes, sort of, possibly the Nephilim. The Nephilim is a whole different subject that we could talk about for yeah, hours. I, yeah. But there may be a connection between them. Yes, um, there are stories about giants living on the earth, all around the world, uh, right. from 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 you know, Indonesia to Central America to to Easter Island. So they were very large beings. Um, Goliath was supposedly one of those creatures from the Bataa Valley who was very, very large, but we don't really know what giants means. We, we don't think they meant 20 foot, 30 foot tall beings. Six and a half, seven foot tall could be gigantic enough, especially if at that time, because of the low amount of agriculture they had, an average sized person was between five and five and a half feet tall. Right. Six and a half feet tall. What taller than you would be pretty imposing. So the Ark of the Covenant, we think generally it goes from Moses to David and Solomon and goes into the temple in Jerusalem, the first temple. Except that's not really correct. It actually travels around to a whole bunch of different locations before it winds up in the temple. And it may not actually wind up in the temple until just a generation or two before Israel and uh, Jerusalem are conquered by Nebuchadnezzar around 580-something, 587 B.C., okay? That it may not have actually shown up there until the late 600 B.C. time period, because at that point, um, Josiah, who was trying to rule centrally from Jerusalem, decided he wanted the Ark of the Covenant here in Jerusalem in order to uh, cement his authority over all of Israel, which was still 12 different tribes scattered into different areas with different allegiances. That's not the normal story that we think of. We think of as David having a, uh, a plan to build the temple, which is not allowed by him to build because of his sins. So his son Solomon builds it, and it's designed specifically to house the Ark of the Covenant. The description is, that the Holy of Holies is a rectangular room that only allows the Ark of the Covenant to be brought in one way, and then you pull the poles out, and then you close it in there like a jail cell, okay? It's so scary that only once a year do they allow the one high priest to go in and visit the Ark of the Covenant, and when he does that, they have a rope tied to his belt, to his waist, so that if he gets struck dead, they can pull him out without having to go in there. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've got a lot of that written in my new book and, and I, I'm familiar with what you're saying and uh, the stories must connect because from my research, you seem like you're right on the same path as what, what I've right. been reading. Yeah. So right. go ahead, David. So the last time we know it's mentioned in the first person is about 20 to 30 years before Babylon is, is able to conquer Jerusalem and take everything away. And when they take everything away, they take including the doors to the temple because they were covered in gold. And we assume that they took all the gold sheeting down from the inside of the temple as well. Um, but there's no mention at all 
of the Ark of the Covenant. There is a story from a few generations before where Jeremiah the prophet prophesied that Israel was going to be attacked and defeated and the temple looted and destroyed. And he was then ordered to take the Ark and hide it through the tunnels under the Temple Mount. Um, there are a lot of people that still to this day think the Ark of the Covenant is hidden below the Temple Mount, except it's been explored multiple times and there's nothing found. There. So it went out from the Temple tunnels to places unknown. Um, there are theories that it went, so one, of the, one of the most well-supported theories is that it wound up in Aksum in Ethiopia. Yeah, and that the little church, is, and that's what I, I have a hard time believing that, you know, that, that it's there. I, I think they might have a, a simulation of it, but that's about well, it. Well, so here's how that story got started. When Solomon was ruling um, in Jerusalem, this lady came up. Um, I believe her name was Bathsheba. She came from the Ethiopian area, and she was so pleasing to Solomon's eyes that he lay with her in biblical right. terms. And she left, you know, she left happily. They sent a bunch of trade goods and things with her. And about 18 years later, this guy shows up and goes, Daddy! It's basically, it's Solomon and Bathsheba's sort of, kind of, illegitimate son because they were married. He hangs around Jerusalem for about three years, and then he leaves with a, a full entourage of the eldest sons of the royal families in Israel, primarily Jerusalem, but other locations as well. He leaves with great fanfare and support. He doesn't run away in the middle of the night, but it took him three years to leave. When he leaves, he goes along the Nile and stops at a place called Elephantine Island, where we have since found the remnants of a camp that matches exactly what the holy tabernacle uh, was that the Israelites, Moses, would create every night in the Sinai Desert during the 40 years of wandering where they would keep the Ark of the Covenant. They found an actual full-sized location, which suggests that the Ark of the Covenant was kept there. They go from there eventually to other locations and stop in some places for as much as 500 years or 800 years, somewhere in that time frame. And then eventually the story is that they wind up going to Aksum, except Aksum didn't exist at the time of Solomon's reign. So this sounds like it's a later edition story. Um, there is the possibility that because it took him three years to leave, that what Solomon gave him was a duplicate, was a copy of it. That's what I start off with in my Eternal Horizons book, is that they find a copy. And no one is allowed to see this in Aksum today because they know it was a copy. They're not even allowed to describe it. In my book, though, they don't keep it in the church because it would just be stolen. Somebody would have stolen it a long time ago. Right, yeah. Instead, they have it up in the hills in a cave that's very well hidden, but it's basically a copy. It doesn't, um, it have, the, it doesn't have the power of the original uh, Ark. Right. Assuming, of course, that the original stories about what the Ark did were real. We're not even 100% sure that the stories they talk about actually happened. It may be something that a later edition put together to make the purpose of the first temple and the centrality of Jerusalem be more important, that it had this great object on the ins on inside. So fast forward a little ways. So um, one of the theories is that it was taken out and brought to Aksum. Another theory is it was brought to the mountain where Moses first saw the Holy Land that he was not allowed to go to, where he supposedly is buried, and that's Mount Nebo. Yeah, there's a there is a passage in the in the Old Testament that talks about the Ark being taken to Mount Nebo. There are also suggestions that it was taken to Mount Sinai in the uh, in the desert, except we don't really know which mountain Mount Sinai was. There are three or four different possibilities. There is the theory that it was taken to the Qumran caves where they found uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, which is not far from Jerusalem and probably would have been an easy trip. We just we don't really know. Um, so if we go ahead to the time of the Knights Temple, um, Christendom had just conquered 
Jerusalem, um, 1099 AD. Um, it's a huge triumph. Um, there's a young man in his teens still, 18 or 19, named Bernard of Clairvaux, who later on becomes Saint Bernard. Don't think of him as the dog in the Swiss legends. Think <laughs> of him, thinking, yeah. think of him as, as a, an incredibly charismatic, smart, and powerful leader, even at a young age. At, at 18, he was getting people three times his age to follow his direction and his orders. Wow. So he contacts two um, veterans of the first crusade that had taken part in conquering Jerusalem. Um, and he asks these two guys to go back to Jerusalem and do some reconnoitering, which they do. When they come back and speak to Bernard of Clairvaux again, he asks them to hire seven more knights whose names we don't actually have and gather their retinue of sergeants of arms and and scribes and other you know associates again a number we don't know but more than just the nine knights and they go back to jerusalem at this point they're not the knights templar they're just nine guys with their retinue on a mission from some guy in france and they go to jerusalem and say hey we would like to be based in a building on the temple mount on the very south side called the Al-Aqsa Mosque, which just happens to be over top of this huge natural cave that was supposedly the stable for Solomon's horses. We're not really sure how true that is, but it's a huge natural cave that just happens to connect to some of the natural caverns under the Temple Mount. And the first king, uh, I believe it was Godfrey I of Lyon, basically tells you, get the hell out of here. I'm trying to run a war and hold this city together. I don't need you guys screwing this all up. Get out. So he dies by poisoning shortly thereafter. The second Godfrey, Godfrey II, says, sure, guys, whatever you want, no problem. <laughs> it's yours. So they base themselves out of the Al-Aqsa Mosque and start investigating through the tunnels what's under the Temple Mount. We know for a fact that they were there because we have since found a, a hilt for a Templar sword spurs, which is kind of cool, and some other objects that show that they were in these tunnels. And they were in these tunnels in their gear. Otherwise, they wouldn't have had swords and, and spurs behind them. Supposedly, they were going to be helping defend the, uh, the routes between the Mediterranean and Jerusalem, where there were a lot of bandits. But there's no record of them fighting at all for nine years. And all that we can tell that they did, they didn't even do any recruiting. All they did was explore the area under the Temple Mount. So nine years goes by and they send a letter back to Bernard of Clairvaux. And in this letter, they say, our mission is a success. We are placing a guard on our returning caravan to protect us from any interference, secular or ecclesiastical. And what year and was that, David? Most, uh, this, well, because they found whatever they found was significant enough that it was valuable in real terms, gold, jewels, gems, whatever, but also possibly heretical. What year? So was, they come, could, I, could I ask you what year it was that, that this happened? Um, well, if, if this was nine years after um, the fall of Jerusalem in 1099, so it would be 1108. Okay. So they come back to France, and only at that point does Bernard of Clairvaux tell the pope he doesn't ask the pope he tells the pope i want this group to be known as the poor knights of the temple the knights temple um, they are granted two abilities that the other knighthoods don't have they're allowed to not pay taxes to the church and they're allowed to charge interest on any money that they make or any money that they lend out right um, the knights hospitallers the hospitalers are a little jealous of this ability for the Knights Templar to have something that they didn't have. From that point on, they are focused on two things. They're focused on trying to find the Ark of the Covenant, and they're focused on building an absolutely amazing network throughout all of Europe. At one point, they were richer than any other king. They were lending money to the German princes. They were lending money to the French king. They were lending money to anybody. One of their downfalls was the fact that the French king owed them so much money, it was easier to actually have them 
broken up and disbanded by his own pope that he had installed in Rome than to pay them back. And in fact, one of the things he was hoping for was when they were arrested on Friday the 13th in October of 1307, that he was hoping that he would be able to pillage their, their uh, uh, preceptory in, in Paris and fill his coffers, except somebody tipped off the Knights Templar and the preceptory was empty. And there's a story that 17 ships left La Rochelle, a port on the west coast of France, with whatever it was that they had in the preceptory in Paris, and we never saw those 17 ships again. Mm -hmm. Was the Ark of the Covenant in there? Here's why I think the Knights Templar never found the Ark of the Covenant. They, because of their money, and they, I should make a side note, one of the reasons they had so much money was if a person wanted to join the Knights Templar, you had to donate 90% of everything you own. And 10% was left for your children and your wife. But 90% of everything you own for thousands of guys would make an incredible bank account. One of the things that they did with that money is they built Chartres Cathedral in Northern France. Chartres Cathedral was picked because it was sort of on this weird confluence of seven underground streams. And it had a lot of underground caverns in which one of them had what was known as the Black Madonna. These become popular after uh, Mary leaves Jerusalem after the crucifixion and winds up in Southern France with Joseph of Arimathea um, and Lazarus and at least one female person with her. Her daughter? Some people, thought, some people think was her daughter. Oh. Okay. From that point on, there are carvings known as the Black Madonna, black because the wood ages to almost a blackness, not because they were starting with black wood. Um, and it's a it's a mother and child. It might be Mary and her daughter. It might be Mary and the infant Jesus. Kind of hard to tell. One of these was found in one of the caverns below the mount where Shark Cathedral was built. When they built Shark Cathedral, they built it with this beautiful labyrinth in the middle, which peasants and pilgrims would use as a form of uh, supplicancy in order to fulfill the supposed um, uh, determination that you're supposed to go to Jerusalem on a pilgrimage once in your lifetime. Well, it's too expensive and too far for 99% of the people. But if you crawled on hands and knees along this labyrinth and made it to the middle and then made it back out, that grueling experience would suffice to be you know, to replace your need to go to Jerusalem. In the middle of this labyrinth, the Knights Templar built a three-armed brazier into which was supposed to be a bowl, into which was supposed to be, we don't know. The ceiling was 200 feet high, and one of the caverns was 200 feet directly below where this labyrinth was. And the theory was they were going to put the Ark of the Covenant underground in this cavern, and they were going to put a natural lodestone in the ceiling. And that by putting those two on opposite sides of this 400 foot long you know, position, that right in the middle where this brazier was would open up a communication to God or a portal. We don't know. Uh, David, I've never... got a question for you. Uh, sure. This, this also is a, they had some religious artifacts, the Knights Templar, because they were able to, to actually black mail the, the Pope. And they did it with some, some religious artifacts that they found. Is that right? Do, what, what did they get? If they didn't get the ark, what did they get that was so important? Okay, so, so now we're going to take another sidestep um, into um, the grail stories. So the first grail stories were written um, a, a couple of generations later. In the early 1200s, the first one was that we really feel is a grail story. It was written by a, name, a man named Crescian de Troyes. Crescian de Troyes lived not far away from where Bernard of Clairvaux lived. And he wrote a story about how there was a knight who came across, he was, he was set out from um, Arthur's table, from the, from, the, from the round table, as many of the knights were to find where the grail was. And when he stumbled across this um, location in France, he was invited to the castle. And he was like the famous guest from Camelot. So he was in a place of honor. And there was a procession that went through, according to the story, 
led first by knights in white surcoat, which appear to be the Knights Templar. There are uh, people carrying candelabras with very bright, you know, mm-hmm. light source. And then there's a, a virgin, a maiden, carrying a platter, which is where we get the word Graal from. It's not G-R-A-I-L, it's G-R-A-A-L. And it means a platter with a recessed area in the middle. So if you had a dessert with a liquid around it, or if you had meat with gravy, it wouldn't spell out the size. That's what a gray owl is. Mm -hmm. And on this gray owl, this platter, there was a single holy wafer that shone so brightly that it made the candelabra seem dim. Wow. And at that point, this knight is supposed to ask a question. But because he grew up without a father and he grew up in the countryside, his mother was always worried that he would seem ignorant if he asked questions. So she told him, don't ask any questions. So this knight watches this procession go by. And the question he was supposed to ask was, whom does the grail serve? Meaning, who will be healed by eating this this wafer? The guy who owned this castle was known as the Fisher King, and he had a wound that would not heal. And because he was wounded, according to the story, so was his land. And until the king could be healed, the land could not be healed. And if he had just said, whom does the grail serve, the grail would have been able, the wafer would have healed the king and healed the land. That was the story. Can I I ask you a question? This this gets into Catholic religion and their, their, uh, their ceremonies. And they have the wafer that they give you, and they, they yeah. say that's that's uh, Jesus Christ. But they also serve it in a in a bowl, like a lot of times the wafers, and they pass it around. Does that have anything to do with it? Well, when this story, so let me finish the story. Okay. So so because he doesn't ask this question, everybody is disappointed. They take him to a room. They let him sleep off the night. He wakes up in the morning. The castle's gone. He wakes up in the same field where he first found these people. And it takes him 10 years to get back to the same spot, find the castle again. He finally asks the question, and the story ends. Wow. As soon as he asks the question, the story ends. Now, the Knights Templar at this time had protected a group of Jewish scholars in southern France. Southern France is where the term Graal comes from. Mm-hmm. Okay? Okay. Um, At the time that this story becomes popular in northern France, central France, um, the Catholic Church thinks it's heretical and tries to have these stories banned. These stories do not stay banned. In fact, because of the oppression, a whole bunch of other stories about the Grail start coming out. And finally, the Catholic Church says, well, we better create our own version. So they create a version where the Grail is the cup used at the Last Supper. Except if you notice, some of the people who apparently are in the know, like uh, Leonardo da Vinci, he painted his famous The Last Supper without any drinking objects of any kind on the table. It wasn't an accident. He didn't just go, oh, my God, I forgot to put in any cups. He specifically wanted to say the grail has nothing to do with the cup of The Last Supper. Okay, It has to do with this wafer. This wafer that glows so bright is synonymous with the the pot of manna that's in the Ark of the Covenant. Mm -hmm. The Knights Templar had something decoded by the Jewish scribes in southern France that explained to them why the manna was significant. And they built a story around the manna, which then leads to the whole idea of the philosopher's stone being this white powdery stone that can change lead into gold, except that wasn't the story. That that was the hidden outer story. The real story was gold could be changed into monatomic gold, but you weren't supposed to know that unless you were in on the secret. Instead, they go into this whole thing about you can change lead into gold, which would bring out people who were greedy, and you'd know those weren't the ones that were ready for the true story about the monatomic gold. Right. Um, when they built Chartres Cathedral, they built it with an unusual type of stained glass that apparently allows in more light when it's near sunrise or sunset, near twilight, than it does at the brightest part of day, which is an odd feature. Um, it's apparently the only stained glass like that. 
um, there's a possibility that whatever this monatomic gold substance was, if they had found some of it, you could put it the way you put metal into stained glass, and it might have given their stained glass a different ability than anybody else's stained glass. So, uh, and by the way, at this point, we know that the Knights Templar worked with the Jewish scribes in Southern France because they started using the first bank check system for people going to the Holy Land. There was always a chance of people being robbed, especially in the Mediterranean by pirates. So what the Templars did was they allowed you to deposit money in one of the temple uh, preceptories anywhere in France. And they would give you a script with a code on it that when you took it to Jerusalem, the king in Jerusalem or the Knights Templar representatives there actually would give you the equivalent amount of gold minus a slight handling fee. Right. And it would be safe for you to travel. You wouldn't be traveling with all this gold. That's how this we that's how we got, got this the, the modern banking system in a way. Right. Right. And this code was one that we have since figured out is used in ancient uh, Jewish documents prior to the destruction of the second temple in 71 AD by the Romans. It hadn't appeared for a thousand years until the Knights Templar started using it because the Knights Templar were getting documents from the um, from underneath the Temple Mount and having their Jewish friends in Southern France transcribe them for them. And the, the Jewish scholars must have gone, hey, look at this, there's a code in here. You guys should use this, this would be helpful. Um, but from that point on, the Knights Templar searched all over the Holy Land. There is a famous object that was found with the Dead Sea Scrolls called the Copper Scroll. And this Copper Scroll, which had to be cut apart because it's so heavily oxidized that it wouldn't bend anymore. Um, this Copper Scroll records unique locations for items that were being stored because they knew that the Second Temple was going to fall to the Romans. So they hid vast amounts of treasure all over Israel but they hid it in places like behind the brown barn on Uncle Isaac's farm or in the well next to the cypress tree that's the last one in Jebusiah's farm. You know, the kind of stuff that doesn't mean anything to us, but only meant something to the people who made the Copper Scroll. The Copper Scroll says there's a second copy buried under the Temple Mount. And we think the Knights Templar found that along with these other documents and then went searching for the Ark of the Covenant and never found it. It's, it's possible that they found it, but if they did, they would have installed it at Shark Cathedral. Right. At least that's what I believe. Now, the so, leader of the Knights Templar, after, I guess, what they call, a, 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 what's that, Black for, uh, Friday or something like that, when they all got killed by the King of France. Uh, and then well, arrested. Later, they weren't yeah. killed, but... Yeah, um, yeah, Friday the 13th started because of that day when they were arrested. However, and this is the interesting thing, they were tipped off. They got everything out of the Paris preceptory into the 17 ships at La Rochelle and left, and yet stayed behind and took their punishment. Now, one of the things that they were accused of was worshiping a bearded figure, and we don't know what that means. We think it might have something to do with John the Baptist, um, but we're not really sure. Mm -hmm. um, there were there were Knights Templar that admitted that they had a chest with a bearded figure connected to it. Maybe they found John the Baptist's head. Who yeah. knows? The other thing that's interesting is they were also accused of spitting on the cross and denying the cross. And their defense was, well, if we are tortured by Mus my Muslims or anybody else, um, they would ask us to prove that we have gone away from our ways. So they would ask us to spit on the cross. So we had to make sure that our uh, knights would do that and still be able to survive. Except the odd thing is, according to some sources, Bernard of Clairvaux wrote 300 something sermons. None of them mentioned Jesus. They're all about Mary. And there is this theory that Jesus did not die on the cross. There are certain inconsistencies with the idea of Jesus's uh, crucifixion that don't fit with what we know historically about Roman crucifixion. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so there's that possibility. And I could get into that, but that's a whole different thing. So the 17 ships leave. We don't know where they go. In 1314, there's a famous battle that occurs in Scotland where it might 
talk about the last ride of the Knights Templar. There's the, the country of Scotland had been under complete countrywide edict from the Pope because um, uh, Robert the Bruce had had a scheduled peaceful parley with one of his rivals at a church, and then he murdered him <laughs> in the church, which had him basically excommunicated. And because the rest of the country wouldn't give him up, the Pope excommunicated the entire country. And the country's like, yeah, fine, whatever. So when the Knights Templar had to hide out from the Catholic Church, from the Pope, what better place to go than Scotland? So there's this change in the Scottish military over the next seven years, from 1307 to 1314, where their main body of infantry called the Schiltron, which are basically large round groups of guys holding spears, before they used to just be a defensive formation that wouldn't move. And the... British would come up or the English would come up and fire arrows at them. And then when enough of them died, they'd hit them with cavalry and it would be over. Well, somebody taught the Schiltrons how to march in formation. And there is a battle at a place called the Bannock Burn, which is a long, narrow, deep creek. And at this battle, the English brought like their entire force with as many knights as they could muster. And the Scots had basically all their Schiltrons and a few light cavalry and some archers. And they held him to a standstill. Um, and it looked like maybe the British were going, the English were going to win because there were no more reserves. And in the back of the Scottish formation is a place called Coxtet Hill, where the Scots had set up their baggage camp and um, some you know, camp bearers and things like that. And from this area, came down a charge of men in white. And the English knights, when they saw this, thought this was the Knights Templar doing their like last ride to the death. So they grabbed the English king and pulled him out of there. And when the English king ran, so did the rest of the army. And the, the Scots won a tremendous battle. It basically guaranteed uh, Scottish freedom for the next 350 years. Okay, with well, a couple of minutes left. Was, yeah. With a, that, couple of minutes, with a couple of minutes left, uh, could yep. you tell us about Oak Island? And if, and Oak Island doesn't have the Ark of the Covenant, right? Not likely, no. However, it's interesting that La Rochelle is at 46 degrees and nine minutes north latitude, and Oak Island is, Oak Island is at 44 degrees and 30 minutes north latitude. So if you, sold, if you sailed due west from La Rochelle and kind of went a little south, you'd hit Oak Island. And it's possible that the Knights Templar did stop by there, and maybe they are responsible for planting the oak trees that give it its name. The reason it's called Oak Island is because it's got oak trees, which are not seen anywhere else in Nova Scotia. Right. And then they're so finding a lot of artifacts from, from the Knights Templar also there. Uh, tell us a little bit about where we can find you, because we're down to our last minute, and this went so okay. fast, uh, David. Uh, uh, David, got, tell us where have, we can find you. Okay. I have, I have so many more notes. To go I know. Through. Okay, so you can, you can find links on my Twitter account. I'm still on Twitter. I don't know how much longer. Um, my Twitter handle is Templar Scribe uh, because there were three ranks of the Templars. There were the Knights, there were the Clerics, and there were the Scribes. And the Scribes were usually the only ones that could actually do any writing. So Templar Scribe at Twitter. There's a link to my vocal.media website where my short stories are. And there's also a link to my uh, network uh, ISA uh, screenwriting uh, location where you can see some of my screenplays. If you want. Great. That sounds really good. David White. Uh, wow. What an impressive memory you have. I mean, you're just, you're just, this is coming from memory. You, you do so much reading and research. Kudos to you, brother. Uh, Thank I, you. I really enjoy it. Thank you so much. And this is the Dave Emmons show. We're signing off for this segment. David White will be back because he's got so much more to talk about. He's, he's loaded with information. So uh, he will be back and we'll explain. <laughs> something. We hope you enjoyed the show with the nice Templar and the Ark of the Covenant and uh, good night, everybody, or good day. And David White, thank you so much for being on. You're welcome. Happy holidays, everyone. Yeah. Happy holidays. Thank you. <laughs>